if a child was hit uh, by one of the parents, uh, they they often brace themselves to not be hit again. But what happens though is it stays in that bracing pattern, and it tells the brain that there's trauma, and the trauma is happening right now. You know, Faulkner said it. The past is never over. It's never. Uh, it's never in the past. Mm. The past is never in the past. I guess is basically what he said. Peter, thank you so much for doing this. I know what a busy man you are. Uh, it's an honor to uh, conduct this conversation. Welcome to the show. Thanks for doing this. Okay, glad. I wanted to start by learning a little bit about what you remember from the beginning of your career. I've done a decent amount of um, reading and viewing of your uh, long form interviews that you've done previous to, to this one in preparation for the conversation. And I've heard you talk about what the culture was like in, I think, the 60s and 70s when you first started yeah. to do work on trauma and what a different world that seems to really have been from the one that we live in. I've heard you speak yeah. about the fact that you worked with Vietnam vets that were coming back from Southeast mm-hmm. Asia. What do yeah. you remember about that time? Um, the word shell shocked, I know, I think stemmed mm-hmm. from World War One, but that's I'd correct. Love to give you an opportunity to talk about what it was like when you first started your career, what you remember about that time. Yeah, I think shell shock is a good name too. It's in a way, it's maybe bad that it kind of went to the uh, you know, went to the end where the garbage goes, but uh, because it really is graphic, it really describes what happens. You can almost imagine the shells exploding right over the trenches where the men were, and how they just came frozen. They were re- literally in shock. Uh, so when I began my work, which really was in the uh, mid nineteen uh, sixties. The whole idea of trauma as PTSD had not yet come into the lexicon. And uh, so in a way, I was both an advantage and a disadvantage. The advantage, the advantage is I didn't know that trauma was supposed to be an incurable brain disorder, even a brain disease, that could be only managed with medications and um also trying to help people change their negative thoughts. And so what I observed, and which I later then related to the term trauma, is what I happened to some, uh, that happened to me in working with this particular person. But let me just kind of backtrack a little bit. So the late, mid to late 1960s, I was doing some interesting work, kind of a pilot study with a number of men who had high blood pressure. And and, uh, I would get them to relax certain muscles in in a sequence from their neck and their shoulders and their jaw. And uh, their blood pressure often would go from a high level. It would drop 10, 20, sometimes even 30 points. And with many of them, um, it stayed in that normal level. So I kind of, kind of forget, forgot that and went on my way and developing what now is called somatic experiencing. So I was asked to see this woman, uh, a friend of mine, a dear, dear friend of mine who also has passed, uh, asked if I would see this patient. And she was a psychiatrist. And, uh, this woman, I call her Nancy and died from, uh, from, uh, doctor to doctor to try to diagnose these physical uh, problems that she was having, what we would now call fibromyalgia, irritable bowel, uh, migraine, severe PMS, and so forth. And he, and this, this woman, again, he, because she had all of these conditions, uh, they, they, the, uh, the, one of the physicians referred them to him. Uh, because they thought, because she had severe anxiety disorders, really to the point where she could really not even leave the house except with her husband. And even then, it was an ordeal. So, uh, so my friend Ed, uh, he thought that maybe some of those same relaxation 
I keep put that in quote, relaxation exercises that I developed with the men with high blood pressure that maybe would at least help her a little bit so it, t- she would have somewhat of a life. And so she came in with her husband. Her eyes were wide open, you know, like a deer in the headlight. And, uh, and she was grasping out to her husband. And you could see they were both so uncomfortable. I mean, he having to be responsible for every move and her for so being so, needing to be so dependent on him. So anyhow, I, sure, I assured them we would just do some uh, ba- basic exercises and to see if that might be helpful for her. So she came in and... and um, she she was sitting in it. She was laying down, actually, I think. And so um, I had her, I went through this relaxation set technique. And, and uh, her when she came in, her heart rate was about 130 beats a minute. Like, boom, 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 boom. So I, I, I did the exercises with her. They're, I really call them awareness exercises, awareness exercises, because it's not about what you do but really sensing the body. And that was the key in developing somatic experiencing. So anyhow, back to Nancy. So her heart rate is going down to like 120, 110, 180, 70. And I don't know if you can imagine when you're just starting out in your career and you have some success, you think you're so smart and you know what you're doing. Well, of course, the root awakening is you don't really know what you're doing. But I was pretty convinced that I was doing something that was valuable. But then, in a moment, her heart rate shot up from that normal level to even a higher level, like about 140, 150 beats a minute. So if you and your audience can imagine the most foolish thing I could say or do, the stupidest thing I could say, you would probably have guessed it right. Because what I said is, Nancy, Nancy, you must relax. You need to relax. So by hook or by crook, her heart rate started going down again, down to 110, 120, 110, 90, 80, 70, 60. And she turned pale. And she opened her eyes wide and grabbed onto my eyes. And she said something like, doctor, doctor, I'm dying. I'm dying. Don't let me die. Help me. Don't let me die. So even as I tell you this story, which was, I don't know how many decades ago, I still get a little bit of a twinge in my chest. But I mean, of course, I know to just let it move through. Um, But anyhow, at that moment, I had the image that uh, came up spontaneously of a tiger crouching in the corner of the therapy room and getting ready to spring forward. And so, again, with not quite knowing why, at the time, I said, Nancy, Nancy, there's a tiger there. The tiger's crouching. It's going to spring, and, and you need to run. You need to run and to climb those rocks and to be able to sit on the ledge and then look down. So at first, nothing happened. If anything, it seems like she felt even more stuck. So I encouraged her. I said, Nancy, I'm right here with you. I can help. We can do this together. Just let your legs start to move, even if it's only a little bit. Just let them start to move. And then for the next 30, 40 minutes, her body went through these cycles of being very her hands were being frozen cold. They were blue. Mm. Um, her heartbeat was very low or very high. And she just went back and forth between these these states. And then her body would sometimes shake and tremble. And then often deep, spontaneous breaths would occur. And this went on for some cycles. And the the breath became more and more spontaneous. She felt the more safe enough in her body. And so she opened her eyes. And this time, instead of grabbing onto my eyes, 
she, her eyes engaged my eyes. And this may seem like a trivial matter, but it's, as I'll say, explain later, it is by no means not trivial. And so anyhow, uh, she, um, she asked me if I wanted to know what had happened. Mm. And I said, yes, that would be very helpful, I think. Thank you. And she said, well, when you first told me about the tiger, I could see that image. And I tried to run, but my legs were like lead. It was like the legs, my legs were like running through quicksand, through mud, and I could barely move. But when you were there with me, again, an important thing in helping people heal, uh, I was starting to feel my legs starting to move. And then I could feel myself running. And then I could feel my whole body climbing the rocks and then sitting on top of the rocks and then looking down. And when I looked down, she said, I saw the tiger and I knew I was safe. And the image of the tiger receded and disappeared. And then I had an image of seeing me when I was four years old. She was 24 at the time of the section. Uh, when I had uh, my tonsils taken out. And at the time, this was done with ether, and it could be terrifying for the child, absolutely terrifying. And it was routinely done. Mm. And she said, I saw myself lying down there, and all the doctors and the nurses were holding my arms and my legs, holding me down so I couldn't move. I was terrified, and I couldn't move. And my body had needed to run, or this I kind of added, my mm -hmm. body needed to run for 20 years because I was still stuck there in that operating room being held down. And amazingly, that was the last panic attack that she had. Mm -hmm. And also after a few sessions, many of the symptoms, the physical symptoms, also disappeared or at least became much, much less so that she was able to go on with her life. Mm. So at that point, a couple of things. I realized, first of all, that it, uh, it could have, uh, I could have actually re-traumatized her. Mm. But by hook, hook or crook, uh, we were able to move through the trauma, to get to touch the trauma, to not go too deeply into the trauma. And that again became a uh, an important uh, tenet of somatic experiencing, not exposing the people all at once. So I was concerned as I thought about it that I was, you know, that I was in a way fortunate because it could have turned out not well. But again, it let me take the next step, which was to know that it's so important to not let people uh, go through these traumatic sensations and feelings all at once. We have to gradually titrate that, to touch into them so that they're not overwhelmed. Because in terms of the nervous system and the body, being overwhelmed is, this, is the same as the original trauma. Mm. So that's really what's an important, important thing. And I also, of course, realized that my life uh, had changed, that my life's work would be really to develop this which I did with a group of about a dozen or 15 therapists in Berkeley, Berkeley, California. And they would come out to, they call it my tree house in Wildcat Canyon uh, every week or two. And I would work with people. And, uh, and, and then uh, I would uh, try to explain what I was doing and they would be asking me questions. And we really worked together in developing um, somatic experiencing. So again, my life is in a direction that I never would have, could have imagined. I thought I was going to be an engineer for NASA. By the way, I actually got to work with some of the astronauts at uh, in NASA. That, that's another story itself. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we have time for that. Well, oh, maybe we do. Actually, maybe you do. Well, Peter, you know, Peter uh, b b before we go into the, into that, I, I think the story of Nancy, right? Everyone, I think, probably can relate to someone in their life that they know or have come in contact with who reminds them of Nancy or have themselves been well, through yeah. periods of their life where they have 
that sort of reaction to something that's happened to them in the past. And yeah, yeah. But my, you know, my reading into a lot of your work is increasing cultural understanding of what it means to be traumatized. Yeah. And yeah. before, you know, I know, I, I think I heard you say this once in an interview that when Waking the Tiger came out in the mid 90s, it was one of the first two books ever published about trauma. And what, yeah, prior to you entering the scene, if someone like Nancy, were coming to a, a therapist or were known to have these sort of what we now call traumatic uh, reactions to things that have right. that happened to her, how would they be viewed? What what had been the you, the outlook on people like her prior to s- sort of some of the um, you know revolutionary ideas that I think you and other people you've you've spoken about uh, began to put forward? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Good part. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, this was such a new approach. Although, looking back historically, I think there were some people doing this, something mm. like this, around the turn of the not the, this past century, but the, around the 19, early nineteen hundred. Mm. And um, I don't know how similar it was. Somehow they got ignored or just pushed to the side. And, you know, when the soldiers come back, came back from World War II, for example, I mean, they had these different advantages. They could go to college, they could mm. get a loan to buy a house and something like that. And they, you know, in their mind, they were just supposed to, you know, just adjust and get back to a normal life. But with so many of them, that's not what happened. And many of them not even had these memories come up sometimes in their very late ages, sometimes mm-hmm. in their 60s, 70s. And that's one of the things, again, that I noticed, even though the person may not show these symptoms, they remain in a way hidden and they will, something may trigger them, but then they explode forth. So again, as I was saying, the, uh, the, the idea of trauma as something that happens in the body mm. was to, that was, I think, almost completely new. So mm. let me give you kind of an example. So uh, it's typical that we have tension in our shoulders. So often that comes from a guarding response, a, a guarding reflex. So for example, if a child was hit uh, by one of the parents, uh, they they often brace themselves to not be hit again. But what happens though is it stays in that bracing pattern and it tells the brain that there's trauma and the trauma is happening right now. You know, Faulkner said the past is never over. It's never uh, it's never in the past. Hmm. The past is never in the past. I guess is basically what he said. And. Uh, So, uh, so there really wasn't an avenue. Like uh, my my colleague, the psychiatrist at that time, if you can believe it, there were only two psych uh, uh, anti anxiety drugs. It was, I think, uh, Milltown or something like that, and uh, and one uh, one uh, tricyclic antidepressant. So that was really all that was available. But people were suffering, you know, and they really went through difficult stuff. Mm. And in a way, my going through some of my trauma, actually, I just, uh, uh, in the process of um, going through the publication of a book that I wrote about my experience called An Autobiography of Trauma, A Healing Mm. Journey. Mm. And so what I developed really, uh, it really came from my own life, my own experience what I went through and how I was able to heal and how that could be used to help other people heal from their traumas. Because trauma is a fact of life. Mm. There's very few people uh, who haven't had some significant trauma in their life. And, you know, and have this need, because in not all cases, but in many cases, it's deeply preventing them from engaging in life. And, um, and, and so that was the same. By the way, you said that was only my, the only book. Uh, there was another book also at that time 
It was by Judith Terman called, 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 what was Judith's book called? Um, Trauma and Recovery. Mm. I think, I think that's what it was called. And it was a very important book. And there was also another book around that time. I don't remember her name. Uh, uh, she was a, a European, but there was very few available and certainly nothing on uh, really what it takes to, to transform, to heal mm. traumatic experiencing. And going back to, to Nancy for one moment, when she was looking at me and we made this eye contact, this connection, she also reported that when she was watching from above, from the cliff, she felt in her body warm, tingling waves. Mm. And so again, that was another critical point because it was a matter really of, um, of a connection between transforming trauma and certain spiritual states that often portals open, doors open, after people work through their trauma. And um, so again, it's, it's, it's something that I realized was an intrinsically wedded unity between trauma transformed, healed, and different spiritual states. And I, as I get to observe this over the past 50 years, it became more and more clear how closely related they are, mm. and what the gift that trauma resolves can give us. Even though trauma is hell, hell on earth, it's really about fixity, about stuckness. But with the right tools, trauma doesn't have to rule, that we can release some of these things in our body. Like if our shoulders are like this, a way I might work with that is have the person just First of all, do what I did, put their shoulders up and then release them down. But now to do it at one tenth the, so the, the speed and only a small amount. So I'm just raising my shoulders this amount very slowly and then I'm letting go, I'm releasing it. And often there, after a while, at least there are sensations, tingling, vibration, and so forth that's often spread through the whole body. So I might have the person do that again and then let it rise a little bit more, but not much more, and then just letting the shoulders release. So, you know, the title of, of uh, well, there's Waking the Tiger was the first book, but my main book was called In an Unspoken Voice, How the Body Releases Trauma and Restores Goodness. And this restoration of goodness, I think, is what truly healing is about. Yeah. You know, I think we have this deep urge, this deep press towards wholeness, towards healing. And I think that's like, it's an, almost an innate instinct in all of us. I don't mean 100%, but in so many of us, really, to be able to come back more into life, to connect with our life energy, to connect with our life force. And that, again, it's rather than erasing the trauma, or trying to change our thoughts, it really is to restore that capacity for full feeling in the body, embodiment, to mm. feel alive and present in our body. Mm. And I think that was, again, that was so missing in understanding trauma, is how it happens in the body, how it presents itself in the body, and how you really need to work with it in the body to resolve these states and move towards greater vibrancy and wholeness. You said, this a minute, yeah. Yeah. you said this a minute ago that trauma is hell. And when you just that one anecdote about Nancy, you know, living in that reality every single day without yep. the tools to know how to deal with it sounds like hell. I have to imagine back 20, 30, 40 years ago, it's doubly difficult, if not more, if there isn't this framework to view trauma as something that is physical, that is stuck yeah. in the body, and in that perhaps that there's even a cultural undertone of it being a moral failing. 
um, uh, one, one's inability yes. to resolve it. I'd love to give you an opportunity to speak about what you remember about how people talked about unrelenting trauma with people who couldn't quote snap out of it. What, what do you recall there. from back in the day about that idea? Yeah. Well, I would say it's, it's quite common. I think part of it is, stems from people's uh, experience of their own trauma, which mm -hmm. are very hidden. <laughs> so if somebody is working to heal their trauma, I think it, it may uh, it may threaten uh, people who have pushed it aside and just said it doesn't exist. I won't mm -hmm. go there. I won't touch that. So and and then often I think people then themselves, but with the help of others, the pejorative help of others, uh, see this as a moral shit feeling, a failing, a moral failing. And of course, it's not. Hmm. Everybody has their breaking point. Everybody snaps at some point. Even the Navy SEALs, even the astronaut, you get to a certain place, and everybody has that vulnerability. It's a universal response to overwhelming threat and helplessness. And, you know, I've asked to work with different people over the time. Uh, there was this movie that was made uh, by, what was the name of that? Um, National Geographic. It was called uh, Fear. Hmm. And so a part of that, they had me work with this young man. He was a champion snowboarder, and he was he posed for different commercials. And so he was going to drop out of a plane and have a parachute. And this was about five thousand feet above this mountain in New Zealand. Mm. And and then he was he would twist and everything. And they filmed the whole thing because they were going to use it as a commercial. But anyhow, the parachute didn't open. The secondary parachute didn't open. And he landed on his back, thankfully, with, yes, with, with uh, thick snow, with a lot of snow. And he, he survived. And he, in the interviews that we did, he said, oh, I have no trauma about this. Uh, I am, you know, I just, I just, it doesn't come up for me. You know, I, I, I feel fine. I, there was no, no problem. Okay. But then when I kind of snuck in a little bit, I said, let's just talk about this a little bit. And he got to where he's falling and the parachute doesn't run, open. And that terror that he experienced that he was denying that he was pushing away. So I would say everybody has some degree of trauma and, you know, even in my own experience in, in my, autobiograph my autobiographical book, I talk a little bit about, you know, I had some pretty heavy stuff happen to me. Um, but I, 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 I reflected and I wrote, but I know that people have m much more uh, difficult childhoods, you know, where there's tremendous amount of abuse and neglect. Uh, but then I thought about that and I said, you know, in working with trauma for half a century, um, trauma is trauma, and it it's universal response. And how we deal with it, of course, is different from person to person. But there is no such thing as this trauma is better or worse than that trauma. Because as long as it's holding us back in our life and not mm. allowing us to live fully, mm. then it's affecting us. And then it's worth exploring. And again, the idea, again, is not to go into the trauma head first, but to gently touch into it. So um, in Nancy, imagining I might have taken this one small step at a time, and which is, of course, how I work with now. And um, and amazingly, f from that group of 12 or 15 people in Berkeley, or from Berkeley, um, it's now reached, I believe, over 40,000 people have, have trained worldwide. 
and I think there's about 70 uh, SE uh, trainers, uh, therapist trainers that are working now in, I think, 42 different countries. So I think it, it touched the cord. People recognize how important it is. One of the other things I, I wrote in, in an unspoken voice is trauma isn't just what happens to us, but what we hold inside in the absence of that present empathetic other, that other person who's there, who's had that experience, who's moved through it themselves and can be present for another. And that's sort of an implicit thing that really has to happen in, in, in trauma healing. So, um, so again, it's, it's nothing to be ashamed of. It truly is nothing to be ashamed of. Again, the people who are supposedly the strongest, most resilient people, they have the place where they have a breaking point. So trauma is trauma, whatever the source, whatever the cause. And anybody and everybody deserves to have the healing to come to the, that wholeness, which we all, in a way, hold inside. Mm. And uh, and come back into life. Uh, maybe I'm just going on too too long, but uh, <laughs> when it gets stuck, it's stuck in the body. So you have to work with the body, and you have to work kindly and compassionately with the body, with the person's experience in their body. Often, people, if you ask them what they're feeling, what they're experiencing, they'll say nothing. And often, these are people that have a lot of trauma. And so I'll say something like, well, is that like feeling numb? And then there's a pause. And the person said, yes, that's right. I'm feeling numb. I said, okay, that's a feeling. We can start with that and then continue to work and allow for some other feelings to begin to come out of the numbness. And then we, of course, then work with somatic experiencing with the trauma. I don't know I want to say one more thing about somatic experiencing. When I first was developing it in the 1970s, you know, uh, some of the people who I was training said this should only be taught to psychologists and psychiatrists. And I said, no, I, I don't agree with that. I think there are so many people who work with trauma, physical therapists, physical mm -hmm. therapists, body workers, and so forth, that I think because it's not about a specific modality. It's about how people do what they do. And it really is applicable to anybody who's in the healing profession. Mm. Um, and yeah, so again, uh, you know, this is off my shoulders. The weight of this is off my shoulders. And again, it's off to those teachers. So I can do things that I really want to do to continue with my life, to live uh, a more relaxed life, to, um, uh, also to uh, to to do some uh, writing, hmm. work writing on books. I, actually, writing for me is a is a good meditation. It's not the easiest thing to do in in life. Like this last book, uh, autobiography, uh, took me about three years to write. And but but I originally wrote it as an excavation of my own experience, my own wounded healer within. Hmm. And, um, but it really was, it, I really wrestled whether I would even publish it because it was really so vulnerable and I, it really frightened me to actually bring it into the public. And I wasn't going to do it. I was just going to let it be for me, for my own purposes of healing. But then I had the following dream. Dreams of are very important to me, have been very, very important to me. Very important. And so I had this dream of facing this expanse of metal, like sloped down a little bit. And in my hands, I held two uh, uh, pages, uh, typewritten pages. And I looked from hand to hand and just wondering what I would do with this. But then my unconscious came and a wind came from behind me and blew all of these 
pages out into the meadow to land where they may, where they might. And from that dream, that was my decision to end, even though it was really frightening for me to do this, really frightening and exposing and left me vulnerable in many, many ways. It was clear that I was to just let go of it and to let it go where it would go. And if it, and my hope was that it would help people heal their own traumas and even write their own stories. Mm. So I guess in a way that's my story. Yeah. I have no doubt that you sharing that will help many, many people. And I think you're right that one of the ways that often that people are able to help themselves is by accurately sharing what they've been through. And I'm, I'm curious yeah. if you're comfortable with it. Um, and maybe this is a conversation for another time, but the parts that were so difficult for you, right? This is coming out and this is going to be available. What, what, what do you remember? What was, what were the aspects of it that were tough for you? Yeah. Well, let me start with what wasn't tough for me. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, the principle I was just talking about, about as uh, not going right into the trauma. <laughs> so I took my own advice and two memories came up for mm. me. One was, I think I was around four years old, four or five years old. And I guess it was my birthday. And in the middle of the night, my parents snuck into my bedroom. And they laid a railroad tracks under the bed and then out into the room and then back again in under the bed in an oval. Hmm. And when I woke in the morning, it was to that train going around the track. And I jumped out of bed and I went to the transformer to control the speed. And I made the horn go beep, beep. I was just so, I felt loved. I felt hmm. cared for. So to work with that first and how that is in the body. And there was another also specific memory of when my father was a counselor at the summer camp and there was a swimming pool and I would, he would have me jump to the water and he would make sure that I didn't drown. And each time I became, was more and more excited. I ran farther, farther away and jumped into the air and landed in his arms. But then I fast forward many decades to when my family was in severe danger from the mafia. Mm. And it's a long story. I mean, I talk the, you know, the details about that, but it was, um, we were living under life threat for many, many, many years. And to keep my family from speaking about it, um, I was raped by a group of, yeah. And it's something that I hid from my parents. I really hid from myself for many, many decades until I realized that I needed one of my trainees because these symptoms were just starting to come up. And so I put my hand, my, my hand, I put myself in the hands of one of the SE therapist and they helped guide me through this so i can't was able to move through uh but i also talked about the milieu how difficult it was not just from things like the rape but to be living under life's threat almost every day and when i would go to 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 school uh i would go through these rituals like not stepping on the cracks and other other rituals um and my my mind didn't know what had happened but my body did because as i walked to school so it was over a mile to, to the junior high school as i walked there i was terrified my body was terrified that i would be raped again and so again i lived with that until i was able to move through it and so again, even telling the story now to you makes me feel more vulnerable than I would like to feel, but I do feel that vulnerability. And at this point in my life, which is, you know, uh, I still have a lot of life in me, hmm. but 
you know, this has been for many, 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 many years. I decided that I would, um, you know, I mean, even when I write books, I think most of the people, and like on Amazon, or say that it real that the book really helped them. But every once in a while, somebody writes something like, basically, this is completely trash. Um, but I, you know, I, it's not that I developed a thick skin. But I understand where this person is coming from, from their own trauma, for their own yeah. neglect and abuse. And so I know that by exposing myself, well, first of all, exposing myself could have been life threat, as I just mentioned, you know, from the mafia. So to, to, to do this to, you know, how many thousand people are going to read this? It scares the bejesus out of me. I mean, it really, really does. But, you know, I think I'm a courageous person in a way. Mm. I don't mean to be patting myself too much on the shoulder, but you know, I'm willing to go to places where people might not want to to, to tread and to use that not only for my own healing, but for others who are dealing with similar issues or dealing with their own issues around trauma. Yeah. Well, Peter, I'm so sorry to hear about that story. I, I had no idea, and I I have no doubt that that specific story, you know, there are countless people that have been through something like that that probably feel yeah. massively alone. Um, yes. And yes. having other people who they especially admire admit that they're human too and have their own challenges and difficulties that they've gone through is, I think, helps yeah, yeah. you use the word wholeness o- uh, earlier that that must help in that yeah. uh, endeavor do you look back on that now as the beginning of you going in the direction that you spent your career of trying to help people work through traumatic events does that make sense to you in retrospect oh, or how do you yeah, make sense nothing else yeah, nothing else would make sense really yeah. i mean i think you know again the idea of uh, the archetype of Chiron, the wounded mm. healer. Uh, I mean, I don't think people are in this business, mm. I mean, maybe some kinds of psychotherapies, but without trauma, you know? And and, uh, and I think people, you said it really correctly, feel massively alone, mm. alone with those secrets that they're hiding from others but like with me hiding also from myself and that given the right tools and support, uh, you know, I mean, working with a competent therapist is a wonderful thing to have somebody there to be your guide who knows about how to do this. I think it's really, really valuable, really valuable. And and, I mean, even myself, quite frankly, you know, I mean, I've done a lot of personal work you know, just not just in my trauma, but in different in different things, and I find that to be a necessary luxury. Like when I'm in Switzerland, I spend quite a bit of time in Switzerland. So there, of course, I work with this wonderful eighty-six year old uh, Jungian analyst. Sure, you know, and here I'm always working on relationships, so I do some work with an attachment uh, oriented therapist. So. I really encourage everybody to seek the healing that your innermost urge is to is to heal is to is to find, and also to know that you can participate in it by doing your own writing, your own journaling. As I say, so when I was writing, you know, my autobiography, there were many things that came up that I really had forgotten mm. and uh and so again it, it really served that purpose the original purpose was for my own healing uh, but again to have these things come up uh it was so important to have somebody there with me to move through that you know there's a wonderful motown song to go something like this it takes one to stand in the dark alone it takes two to let the light shine through. Mm. So uh, like I was saying, it's so important to have that other by our side 
with us and you know, in a way holding our hand as we move through these very difficult sensations and feelings and things that have happened throughout our lives. So, I, I, I'm convinced just in my own time on this earth that a lot of great art, a, gr a lot of great work come from what you alluded to just now, which is people trying to solve their own problems and then sharing them widely with others. Yeah. And, um, you know, you mentioned earlier the somatic experiencing and yeah, you know, for people that hear this and are suffering and are maybe just getting familiar with, with your, your work and your ideas. You know, one thing that came to mind yep. as you were mentioning being in Switzerland, one of my all time favorite interviews I've ever done was with Jim Hollis and oh, he had this oh, 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 oh james hollis yeah james hollis yeah and oh he's lovely he's lovely a wonderful guy amazingly yeah. wise just a quote yeah. and information yeah. machine and one of the things that i quoted that i think i learned from him which was i think a jungian line which i think maps on to some of what you were talking about earlier which is the human psyche wants two things i'm paraphrasing but it's something like this the human psyche wants two things a greater expression of its own capabilities and self-healing um, and I, I just love those pithy ideas that encapsulate so much of human nature in many ways. And, you know, for, for, you know, for you, for, for people that might be hearing this, that are, are stuck and are looking for answers. You talked about, uh, somatic experiences. I've, I've heard yes. you say this in prior interviews that Soma, I believe means body, um, Yes, exactly. For, the living body, the experiencing body. The experiencing body. The experiencing that. What are the, you've been doing this a long time now, you know, what are the first moves that you would recommend for people to try to work through yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. some of the trauma that they're experiencing? Well, I, I again, would definitely recommend a uh, somatic experiencing mm -hmm. therapist, but the one that fits right for you because not all therapists and clients have their right you know chemistry um and you can go to the trauma healing.org uh, website or also to our website somatic experiencing.com and you can get a list of therapists in you know in your area there are therapists in most uh, uh of the u.s states not all but most and then also in the world, everywhere in the world, there are also therapists. So you can go to those websites and, and get that as a resource. I think it's, again, like for me, I don't think if I had had the help from one of my students at SE Therapist, I would have been able to do this alone. I mean, I was able to do a good bit of it alone, but especially after I started to do some of my own work around the, the trauma the the wounded healer and you know when you uh, talked about um uh, james Hollett, hollis uh, you talked about our own capability and self-healing and i think i don't know if he would say this but i think he would or it certainly wouldn't disagree that self is with a capital s and healing is with a capital h mm -hmm. Now you said there were two things. What was the other one? The psyche. Well, I think that the quote I believe is something like the human psyche is in search of or trying to achieve two things: a greater capacity for its, a greater expression of its own capabilities and self healing. Those two right. things at the same time. Yeah. Oh, I see those two. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, yeah. No, he's. I couldn't recommend his writings more. He's. I think one of the most cogent. Jungian oriented people. I mean, he's really quite brilliant. Quite brilliant. He is. There's a quote I've been wanting to read from you that I think kind of hits the the bullseye in my mind about uh, kind of summarizing, as I understand it, the major observations from your work and your your major beliefs. So I want to take just a minute and read this because I think it it's a well, pretty good framework. Uh, and this is from you. In response to threat and injury, animals, including humans, execute biologically based non-conscious action patterns yep, that yep. prepare them to meet the threat and defend themselves. The very structure of trauma, including activation, 
dissociation and freezing are based on the evolution of survival behaviors. Yeah. When threatened or injured, all animals draw from a quote library of possible responses. Yep. We orient, dodge, duck, stiffen, well, brace, retract, flight, free, flee, freeze, collapse, etc. All right. these coordinated responses are somatically based. Yep, they are yep. things that the body does to protect and defend itself. It is when these orient these orienting and defending responses are overwhelmed that we see trauma. The mm. bodies of traumatized people portray quote snapshots of their unsuccessful attempts to defend themselves in the face of threat and injury. Trauma is a highly activated incomplete biological response to threat frozen in time. For example, when we prepare to fight or to flee, muscles throughout our entire body are tensed in specific patterns of high energy readiness. Yeah, when yeah. we are unable to complete the appropriate actions, we fail to discharge with the tremendous energy generated by our survival preparations. This energy becomes fixed in specific patterns of neuromuscular readiness. The Lord person Lord. then stays in a state of acute and then chronic arousal and dysfunction in the central nervous system. This is the part I italicized and bolded. Traumatized people are not suffering from a disease in the normal sense of the word. They have become stuck in an aroused state. Ooh, it is man. difficult, if not impossible, to function normally under these circumstances. Um, I'd love to give you an opportunity to respond to that. I don't know how long it's been since you've come across that quote, but I is thought that, that really hit the nail. I believe that that's where, right. I'm waiting the tiger, yeah. We, yeah. Um, I have to tell you the truth. <laughs> it's I pretty was good. Just listening to you, and I thought <laughs> I don't really have anything to add. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I mean, you know, one of one of my great important teachers. Well, one was was children, but another important teacher was a uh, ethologist, particularly the work of Nicholas Tingbergen, an ethologist are people that study the behavior of animals, of, in, uh, of wild animals in their natural environment. Mm. I learned so much from those ethologists and about developing my capacity to observe what's going on with people. And SE therapists are trained to do that. That's one of the key features in the training program. And uh, and and this contrasts to the way most animal experiments are done. So you're conditioning them, or you know, putting electrodes in their brain. But uh, to really observe them in the natural environment, to to see them, and uh, though Tingberg, and again, who shared the Nobel Prize, he didn't talk about specifically about trauma, but about these prepared ingrained responses uh, that. Um, that are there through evolution mm. as instincts to prepare us from dealing with all different kinds of, of threat. And um, that we share those same uh, impulses as do animals. Well, we are animals. Mm. We're mammals. We're primates. We are homids, hominids. But we're there we're very special in many ways, but really, when you get down to it, we're all animals, and we're all animals, and to be able to to really embrace that in a way like Nancy did mm. is an important component in the healing process. So I want to I, I want to I want to read that that part again, which I think touches on what you just said. Traumatized people are not suffering from a disease in the normal sense of the word. They have become stuck in an aroused state. To me, the framework that you have of looking at people from an, an, a naturalist perspective, a, an evolutionary perspective, seems to be absolutely essential in understanding your perspective on what trauma really is. And I know you talk a lot about animals in nature who go through being chased you know, an Impala That's being right. chased by a lion and shaking the trauma out of them at the end and then re-entering the group. Right, um, and not being traumatized. So what is it that, that, that animals do 
that we're maybe somehow preventing or denying or but it but the animals i i don't say 100% hmm. but most animals go back into their to their life hmm. um you know without scars they i mean they may be cautious more cautious to be in certain areas but that's a good that's a survival instinct as well but if they were traumatized then uh, uh, they certainly wouldn't survive uh, the species wouldn't survive you know and so again i think that it, the more we understand our our brethren mm. the animals the more really compassion we have to the human animal that is within us within all of us and um you know again i've watched the, uh, a lot of filming and but also watching animals in the wild and observing animals and I, very recently this happened i forget exactly where it was i was in somebody's house and a bird i uh, mm-hmm. hit the window and so they were laying down dead apparently dead and my 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 friend was going to pick up the bird to take it you know and throw it away or bury it or i don't know what and i said don't, don't do anything just sit here and just watch. Unfortunately, I didn't have a camera with me. And then after a certain period of time, the bird shook, shook and trembled and then turned over and then off it went as though nothing had happened. But it looked like it was completely dead. So again, these are survival responses that come from our natural heritage. And if we can enlist those, we become so much more strong and so much more resilient as the different animal species do. Hmm. You know, I, I loved learning about your somatic experience and uh, somatic experiences and your just general outlook yeah. on so much of human ailments being trapped in the body. And, uh, you know, one of the best new habits personally for me in the last five years has been essentially daily heated vinyasa yoga. And that activity, unlike I've always been into exercise, that sort of movement, I always have said this to friends, that it moves any day from a scale of one to 10 up three notches. It just cuts out so yep, much yep. of the noise and neurosis and anxiety from life that I'm religious about doing it every day. And yep. you know, I've interviewed somebody on this podcast who has been for many decades, an underground MDMA therapist for people who yeah. have experienced extreme trauma. Sure. You know, I'm I'm um I'm going to be doing hopefully more 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 interviews related to that. And my understanding is that most likely MDMA will be legalized for therapy in the middle of next year. Yeah, you yeah. know, these are to me these are all great sources of hope for civilization. Yeah. I know the news is always filled with great bleakness, but. Yep, you know, yep, in your yep. in your mind, and we talked about this a little bit a few minutes ago. But for for people that are really struggling and are looking for tools, right? No one quite knows what will work perfectly for them. We're all different, and I've heard you say yep. this about you know some things are traumatizing to people that aren't to others, and and vice versa. Um, right. Where would you be point people as uh, areas of life for you know habits or forms of therapy that? You you would you think are at least worthy of exploration to try to improve sure. people's lives to get back to wholeness, like you said. Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, yoga is a really useful practice because it's it's very much about embodiment, especially mm. with the right yoga teachers. Some teachers, it's more like calisthenics. How right. much stray can you take? Um, actually, uh, we a lot of uh, we train a lot of uh, yoga teachers mm. again to be able to do to be more trauma informed. Hmm. in work so it's definitely something that's very useful use of mdma and other um psychedelics is also i think in a way very promising but in my autobiography i have a section on this where i talk about how did did i look at at it oh promises and pitfalls of Hmm. psychedelic therapy you know because i came of age in the 1960s and you know and during that time it was sex drugs and rock and roll Hmm. um but uh to go from there to saying we have to look at some of these cautiously in a way but with holding great promise but also to know for example that it's so important to not just do the psychedelic work but to do something afterwards 
whether it's yoga or some kind of therapy that's ba- that is embodiment based. These are all very important because just doing the trip itself, the, you know, whatever it is, whether it's MDMA or LSD or 5-MeO, uh, it's, uh, it, it really needs to be prepared for. Mm. You know, there's a wonderful, unfortunately, I don't, I think uh, Netflix stopped showing it. And then I got to finish up here. Mm. Uh, it is called the, La- the Last Shaman. And it's about this young boy who uh, he's, has this pervasive depression. And he's tried about everything. I think uh, antidepressants, of course, I think even shock therapy. And so he goes in search of a shaman to guide him with a uh, ayahuasca um, d- drug. And he's very great. And his family, I mean, they're good people. But they're not, they're not warm. They're not people that were holding their babies and so forth. And 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 I also related very much to that. But anyhow, he would do this, and um, and but he was really disappointed because many of them were just after money or they were power hungry to have power over the person. And so finally, he went to this. I think in Peru, this pretty remote village. And the shaman he met was the first one that he really felt what uh, a connection with. And so the shaman gave him an, a ritual to practice every day for a month, and then they would do that. But at the same time, he was in along with these really warm mountain people, with their with their with their help, happy, healthy children, and so it was really like creating a supporting environment, which is also very important in using these, these drugs. Mm. And, um, and when he finally did take the, the drug, he was there also for another few weeks to just integrate it and be there with their warmth and the, their kindness. So I think it is a good model for the therapeutic use of substances like MDA, but really all of these substances. And uh, yeah, anyhow, uh, you know, people can read about, at least about my opinion in, in the autobiography. Uh, I know, but again, um, I just leave it very, very great promises, but also things that we have to look at and be somewhat cautious about. Well, Peter, I want to thank you for um, all the work that you've done. And anyone who is attempting to bring people back to wholeness, I think should be lauded because in my mind, that's the cool. arguably the most important work in the world. You know, maybe if we could close on this very quickly, which is what can we as individuals do to bring about a better world in that, in that regard, in your estimation, if it's anything, I feel like on a micro level, improvements have to start at home with you personally. Um, Any parting words on that? I would love to give you an opportunity to speak to. Okay. I'll talk briefly because it's, it's part of this current thing. I, I I want to be careful. In the, to really uh, understand that in many ways it's 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 in the background it's it's because there's such a, I mean there's real there's a war going on mm. and you know which is horrible and horrible 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 and it's to me it's also another example of nihilistic uh, fascism mm. uh, it it breaks my heart it breaks my heart. And I actually recently did something for a number of therapists from from, from that area. Uh, so anyhow, many, many, 15, 20 years ago, I did a training in Jerusalem and a number of therapists also from uh, Gaza mental health were also able to, to come. And um, I did some work with this man who volunteered Man named Chaim, and he went. He had been severe, had severely severe back pains for thirty years, and we worked on the what we came up with the cause of that that moment where his body got stuck, and everybody could see was very deeply touched by his work. So after a while, so I asked if anybody wanted to share some of what they experienced. So after a while, this woman stood up. She was from Gaza Mental Health, in an elegant woman in a 
uh, you know, three piece like business uh, a suit. And she said something like, Chaim, when you volunteered to work with Dr. Levine, I was praying, I was hoping that something horrible would happen to you, that you would be re traumatized because your people have traumatized my people. And, uh, but something happened when I really let myself feel what's going on with you. And I realized, Chaim, until we find peace with our, within ourselves, we'll never find peace with each other. Mm. And I'm not sure if that's optimistic or pessimistic. But I do think you get to a critical mass when people have done their own healing, that it then becomes a wave that moves forward in time and space. So my deepest hope is that we'll go in that direction because going the opposite direction is certainly not going to work. Amen to that. It's a great place to end. Thank you so much, Peter. You bet. All right. Good talking with you.